The Sign of the Beaver Chapter 23 Matt filled his days with work. He made the cabin trim. Where the clay had dried and crumbled away between the logs, he brought new mud, strengthened it with pebbles, and packed the spaces tightly. On the inside, he chinked every tiny crack to make the room snug. The pile of logs stacked against the cabin wall grew steadily higher. His meager harvest was safely stored away. The corn, the little he had managed to save from the deer and the crows, had all been shucked. Sitting by the fire after his supper, he scraped the dried kernels from the cobs, remembering the many long evenings at home when he and his sister Sarah had been set to the same work with a corn scraper. Sarah would laugh now to see him rubbing away with an old clamshell like an Indian. Some of the years of corn, he had hung against the wall by the twisted husks, as he had seen his mother do. She had said once they were like scraps of sunshine in the dark days. Overhead, he hung strips of pumpkin on ropes of vine strung from wall to wall. They would be ready for his mother to make into pies. In a corner leaned the old flour sack, overflowing with nuts he had gathered, hickory and butternut, and even the acorns he had once thought proper food only for squirrels. On the shelf ranged birch baskets filled with dried berries and the wild cranberries he had discovered shining like jewels along the boggy shores of the pond. They were puckery to the tongue, but when his mother came, she would bring sugar, and the stewed cranberries would make a fine treat with her bread of white flour. Matt forced himself to eat sparingly of these things. The corn he regarded as a sort of trust. His father had planted it and would be counting on it to feed the family through the winter, and some must be saved for the spring planting. Proud though he was of his harvest, Matt knew in his heart that it was far from enough. The hunt for food would be never-ending. Hour after hour with his bow, Matt tramped through the forest, the dog beside him. There was not much game to hunt these days. More often than not, his snares were empty. Soon the animals would be buried deep in burrows. Twice he had glimpsed a caribou moving through the trees, but he had little hope of bringing down any large animal with his light arrows. Once in a long while he succeeded in shooting a duck or a muskrat. The squirrels were too quick for him. Although the dog was certainly not much of a hunter, he did occasionally track down some small creature. But he had to eat his share, sometimes more than his share because Matt could not resist those beseeching eyes. Truth to tell, they were both hungry much of the time. Luckily, they would not starve with the pond and creeks teeming with fish. Matt knew that for many months of the year, fish filled the Indian cook pots. Luckily, too, fish were easy to catch, though Matt had to be continually twisting and splicing new lines from vines and spruce roots. Mornings now he had to shatter a skim of ice on the pond. Soon he would have to cut holes with his axe and let his lines down deep. He shivered to think of it. It was the cold that bothered him most. His homespun jacket was still sound, since he had had little use for it in the warm weather. But his breeches were threadbare. One knee showed naked through a gaping hole, and the frayed leg stopped a good five inches above his ankles. His linen shirt was thin as a page of his father's Bible, and so small for him that it threatened to split every time he moved. Even inside the cabin, he was scarcely warm enough. The moment he ventured outside, his teeth chattered. He thought enviously of the Indian's deerskin leggings. But a deer was far beyond his prowess as a hunter. There were two blankets on his pine bed, his father's and his own. Why couldn't one of them cover him in the daytime as well as in the night? He spread a blanket out on the floor and hacked it with his axe and his knife, using his worn-out breeches as a pattern. From the leftover scraps, he carefully pulled threads and twisted them together. He had seen the Indian women using bone needles, and he searched about outside the cabin till he found some thin, hard bits of bone. 
These he shaved down with his knife. He ruined three bits trying to poke a hole through the bone, before he thought to try a thin slit instead to hold the thread. Finally, he managed to sew his woolen pieces together. He thrust his legs into the shapeless breeches and gathered the top about his waist with a bit of rope. He was mighty pleased with himself. He was going to be forever hauling them up, and they were sure to trip him if he had to run, but at least he could kneel on the ice and pull in his lines. From two rabbit skins, he made some mittens without thumbs. He had no stockings, and his moose hide moccasins were wearing thin. He decided he could stuff them with scraps of blanket or even with duck feathers. He remembered that once in a downpour, a Tian had shown him to line his moccasins with dried moss to soak up the rain. Perhaps moss could soak up the cold as well, and there was plenty of it about. His most satisfying achievement was his fur hat. For this he knew he must have more fur. In the woods, a Tian had once pointed out to him a deadfall constructed of heavy logs so intricately balanced that they would fall with deadly accuracy on any animal that attempted to steal the bait inside. Beaver and otter were caught in such traps, Atian explained, sometimes even bear. Now Matt determined to make one for himself, perhaps a small one. It would take a very large log even to stun a strong animal, and he had no wish to come upon a wounded bear. Much as he would like a bearskin, he would try for a smaller animal. He felled and trimmed two good-sized trees. Setting the logs on lighter post was a feat of delicate balance that took him hours of patient trial and error. Over and over, they crashed down, threatening his toes and fingers. Finally, they held to his satisfaction, and gingerly, he slipped three fish inside the trap. To his astonishment, on the third morning, he found an animal lying under the fallen logs, so nearly dead that it was no task to club it. It was smaller than the otters he had seen playing along the banks, a fisher perhaps. That night, he and the dog feasted on crackling bits of roast meat. It was strong flavored, and he knew the Indians did not care to eat it, but he could not be so choosy. Other strips he hung over the fire to smoke. There was also a scant amount of yellow fat. Used sparingly, a spoonful of that fat would make his usual fish diet taste like a bouquet. The real treasure was the pelt, heavy and luxurious. He worked on it slowly as he had watched the Indian women work. With sharp-edged stone, he scraped away every trace of fat and flesh from the skin, washed it in the creek, and for days in his spare hours rubbed and stretched to make it soft and pliable. Then he set to work with his bone needle. He was enormously proud of the cap he fashioned. Sackness himself would have envied it. Most of this work he had done by firelight. He longed for candles. He ate his supper by the light of split pine branches set in a crack in the chimney. They gave light aplenty, but they smoked and dripped sticky pitch and he was always afraid he might drop off to sleep and wake up to find the log chimney afire. At any rate, after a day of chopping and tramping, he was tired enough to go to bed with the dark. So often, as he did the squaw work that Atian would have despised, thoughts of his mother filled his head. He imagined her moving about the cabin, humming her little tunes as she beat up a batch of cornbread shaking out the board cloth at the door, for of course she would not let them eat at a bare table. He could see her sitting by the firelight in the evening, her knitting needles clicking as she made a woolen sock for him. Sometimes he could almost hear the sound of her voice, and when he shut his eyes, he could see her special smile. He tried to think of ways to please her. She would need new dishes for the good meals she would cook. He whittled out four wooden trenchers and four clean new bowls, rubbing them smooth with sand from the creek. He made a little brush to clean them with from a birch sapling, carefully splitting the ends into thin fibers. In the same way, he made a sturdy birch broom to sweep the floor. Then he set himself to a more difficult task, 
a cradle for the baby. With only an axe and his knife, the work took all his patience. His first attempts were fit only for kindling, but when the cradle was done, he was proud of it. It was clumsy, perhaps, but it rocked without bumping, and there wasn't a splinter anywhere to harm a baby's skin. Sitting by the fire, it seemed a promise that soon his family would be there. When he had a few more rabbit skins, he would make a soft coverlet. For Sarah, he made a corn husk doll with corn silk hair. He was surprised how much he looked forward to Sarah's coming. Back at home, she had been nothing but a pesky child, always following him about and pestering him to be taken along wherever he was going. Now he remembered the way she had run to meet him when he came home from school. Pigtails flying, eyes shining, demanding to know everything that had happened there. Sarah hated fiercely being a girl and having no school to go to. She would be full of curiosity in the forest. She wasn't afraid like most girls. She was spunky enough to try almost anything. She was like that Indian girl, a Tian sister. What a pity they couldn't have known each other. And we'll read chapter 24 next time. Until then, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Love you guys. Thanks so much for listening. Bye-bye.